AMD's 7000 series APUs have been a big success, with dozens of mini PCs and Steam Deck killing handhelds flooding the market, delivering surprising levels of performance and efficiency, the 8000 series has some big shoes to fill. Alas, if you're expecting Zen 5 and RDNA 4, then you're going to be disappointed. However, they do have AI now. Well, more AI. Like the chip that preceded it, the Ryzen 7 8845HS is an 8-core 16-thread CPU based on the refreshed Zen 4 architecture. Although, for clarity, I should point out that these are 8 of what might be called performance cores, as AMD have yet to introduce any of the hybrid, big, little style of processors yet. It clocks up to 5.1 GHz, though due to the 54 watt max TDP, it won't spend much time there. Nevertheless, the 4 nanometer process node makes for impressive performance per watt. It lacks L3 cache compared to desktop Ryzen's, but this is to allow room for the APU party trick, Radeon 780M graphics, which have proven capable of encoding and decoding all manner of HD and UHD content, including the latest AV1 codec, and are more than capable of playing even modern AAA games at reduced resolutions. You might ask how I can tell you all this before running a single benchmark, and that's because We've seen this APU before. The 8845HS is, spec for spec, a perfect match to its predecessor, the 7840HS. Same process node, same cache, same GPU, same core count, same clock speeds, same turbo boost frequency. The only thing that's received an upgrade is the neural processing unit, with 60% more tops. Of course, whatever upgrades have been made to the APU, they're only as good as the PC they're built into. I'm testing out the 8845HS in the K8 from GMK Tech, which they kindly provided for this review, but which they haven't had any input or feedback on ahead of time. This is available as either a bare bones or pre-configured kit, with the base unit costing about £400, and the maximum spec, with 32 gigs of RAM at a 2TB Gen 4 SSD, coming in at about £560. GMK's prices seem to be converted from USD, so prices outside the US may fluctuate as the exchange rate does. These are actually relatively low prices for a mini PC with this tier of processor, and like so many of these brands, they offer discount codes and frequent sales events, so as you might imagine, there are a few cut corners. The outer casing is plastic, as is the top panel that needs removing to access the innards, and so are the clips that hold it in place, which can make upgrading the PC a bit more fraught than I'd like. The port selection also reflects the lower cost of the K8, but still manages to pack in the latest tech. The front panel has the only USB-C port on the whole PC, but it happens to be Gen 4 with 40 gigabits of bandwidth, capable of power delivery, data and display, meaning with the right monitor you could power the whole shebang from a single cable into the mains. There are two more front USB ports, both of which are Type-A 3.2 Gen 2s, as well as a 3.5mm audio jack. On the back of the unit there are a further two Type-A ports, though they are less performant and probably best suited to your mouse and keyboard. One of them is USB 3.2, but only runs at Gen 1 speeds, while the other is USB 2. There's a DisplayPort 1.4 and an HDMI port, though while the DisplayPort is capable of 4K at 144Hz, the HDMI is only version 2, meaning it's limited to 60Hz at 4K. There are two 2.5 gigabit Ethernet ports, which is great to see, and power is provided through a barrel jack. To get into the interior, we have to crack open the previously mentioned plastic cover, then undo four screws to remove the metal plate underneath, being careful to disconnect the fan from its header. This fan is for the storage and RAM, which if you buy a pre-configured unit will be either a 1 or 2 terabyte Gen 4 drive, in my case Alexa, and 32 gigs of socketed DDR5. 
There are two slots for NVMe drives, so this has the potential to host an awful lot of fast flash storage on your network if you wanted to use this as a compact, high-performance file or media server. Alongside these two M.2 slots are the two RAM sockets, which accept DDR5 modules only and, in the pre-configured models of the K8, will be populated with a pair of 16GB sticks of 5600MT RAM. This is the fastest currently available at the time of writing, so unless you have RAM and storage already, you might be better off skipping the bare bones option. When it comes to performance, I'm gonna level with you. For 99.999% of current PC users, there's almost nothing new here. Cinebench R23 saw numbers within a few percent of those given by the Ryzen 7 7840HS, though we can now compare them to the Meteor Lake based Ultra 5 in the GMK Tech K9, which is actually more expensive than the K8. I'm sure Intel would rather compare the Ryzen 7 to the Ultra 7, and I will be doing that in the near future, but in the meantime, the Ultra 5 isn't proving its worth. Geekbench 6's CPU results also hardly deviate from those in the previous gen Ryzen 7, or for that matter, the Ryzen 9. The GPU score is radically different from either 7000 series chip, however, in a bad way. Both OpenCL and Vulkan scores are down by as much as 20%, and while this is repeatable, in the broader context it is an anomaly. In 3D Mark, the results are closer to what you'd expect. The 7840HS still wins in time spy, but by a much smaller amount. The newer CPU is actually about 7% faster, but the GPU weighted overall score doesn't see that as much as it sees the 3% slower GPU. In Firestrike, the margins are thin enough that I'd call them within margin of error. I've recently added the Geekbench ML benchmarks to my test lineup. Of the three mobile chips I've benchmarked so far, the 8845HS is the most powerful, scoring almost 1000 points more than the Ultra 5 125H. The GPU score was even more impressive with a score of 5111 that, according to the chart on Geekbench's website, beats the M2 iPad by more than 50%. For some reason, the NPU benchmark test is only available on the mobile version of Geekbench ML, so I wasn't able to test it with the 8845HS. Maybe it will be added in the future, and I have my fingers crossed that it will be, because there's not much else out there. As far as I can tell, there's only one generally accepted benchmark that tests the NPU right now, and it's not available to the public. UL's Procyon is an AI test that can be used to measure NPU performance, but apparently it has a $5,000 licensing fee, and I love you all, but not that much. All of the big review sites that have tested the capabilities of the Phoenix, Hawkpoint and Meteor Lake NPUs have done so with custom benchmark runs in various AI programs, all of which are outside of my experience. Anyway, in conclusion to my attempted NPU testing, the simple answer is, I don't know. If anyone has any suggestions for how to benchmark NPUs that I haven't mentioned, or machine learning in general, I'd love to hear it. As I've mentioned elsewhere, I've recently revamped my DaVinci Resolve testing procedure, so I don't have as many points of comparison as yet, however the K8 has already established itself at the top of the charts. The H.264 CPU render in the free version of Resolve completes in 8.5 minutes, about 30 seconds faster than the K9's Ultra 5 125H, though close enough to make me even more interested to see what the Ultra 7 can do. The Radeon GPU still proves to be far ahead of even the ARC graphics in the new Intel, with both the H.265 and AV1 renders completing in about 5 minutes 20, and that's a big enough margin that the best I can expect from the Ultra 7's iGPU would be to maybe break even if it's lucky. The K8 performs admirably in the Blender classroom scene. The 8845HS can complete the render in 5 minutes 35 seconds, sitting at the very top of my benchmark chart for mobile CPUs 
as well as desktop CPUs. The Ryzen 5 7500F might have the edge in a lot of areas like L3 cache, RAM performance and TDP, but its 6 cores and 12 threads still put it about 15 seconds behind the APU. The last time I tested the Ryzen 7 7840HS in gaming, I focused on more demanding titles rather than the lighter weight esports type games I usually test on mini PCs, so this time I've decided to do both. Starting with Cyberpunk 2077, at 1080p medium we have just enough performance for a 30fps average, though 1% lows are decidedly cinematic. I'm not a fan of FSR 2 in Cyberpunk, but it's the only upscaling solution that actually works. XESS might look better, but it has at best a minimal benefit to performance, and at worst actually harms it. Enabling FSR quality raises the average to a far smoother 42 FPS, though the game is a bit less crispy as a result. I'd hoped Starfield might deliver a 1080p 30fps experience at the medium preset, however at native resolution the K8 can only muster up 19fps on average with lows of around 14. This is pretty intolerable so I added some FSR at 67% of native resolution, equivalent to FSR quality. This at least made for a cinematic experience, though a slightly blurrier one than usual. I even went as far as to try the frame generation option, which purported to deliver 40fps, but at least in my opinion didn't look or feel any better than 24. Plus, y yeah, maybe don't pan around too much. You might think, based on what I just said about Starfield, that I have a negative opinion on frame generation, and that's Right, I do. However, if more frame gen experiences were like The Last of Us, maybe I'd be a bit more forgiving. It helps that it was starting from a healthier position. At 1080 low, frame gen is absolutely not needed to get a playable experience, with an average of 38 and lows still around the 30 mark. This might look closer to PS3 quality than PS5, but the gameplay experience is certainly tolerable. I was even able to lift the preset to high, which dropped frames to 24 and lows to just above 20 and seemed like an ideal candidate for frame gen. Sure enough, with FSR quality and FG enabled, it lifted the apparent frame rate to 53 and lows to the mid 40s, and unlike Starfield, this actually looked and felt like an improvement. Now, I do these tests with a controller, which can absorb some of the apparent latency. If you play this style of game with mouse and keyboard, your experience of FG might not be so positive, but for me this was actually very enjoyable. The graphical glitch while panning is still very noticeable, so there's still room for improvement. Forbidden West, which is what Kanye calls his new wife, is the latest PlayStation port in my library until Ghost of Tsushima releases in a few days' time. At 1080 low it performs a little better than Starfield, but not enough to negate the need for upscaling. The average is below 23 and 1% are in the teens, and frankly the game looks terrible even without upscaling. Adding FSRQ does bring it up to a not very convincing 30fps average, but the blurriness gets even worse. I also made the mistake of trying AMD's driver based frame gen and <laughs> oh my that's a bad move. Maybe I'll try again when there's a more official implementation of FSR frame gen. So I haven't played Helldivers 2 in a couple of weeks, did I miss anything? No? Everyone having a normal one? Glad to hear it. At 1080 low settings, the 8845HS isn't the best experience to be honest, the average frame rate is 40fps with lows in the 30s, so you might want to use some upscaling if your eyes can tolerate it that is. Forza performance is a known quantity, at 1080 high the 8845HS scores almost exactly the same as its 7000 series predecessor, within a frame of 60fps with TAA turned on and a few frames over 60 with FXAA. I did switch out anti-aliasing for quality FSR, 
but there's very little difference in performance from FXAI at native 1080p. It's all pretty academic anyway, as I found TAA to be perfectly playable. Returning to the more usual mini PC benchmark titles, Apex Legends has at long last added a solo mode, which is certainly a lot more entertaining for me. Benchmarking this game is usually a matter of joining a duos or trios match on my own and trying to avoid being spotted for as long as possible. Anyway, I tested both to confirm that the solo map seems to be no more or less demanding than the others, and both averaged around the 110 to 115 mark at 1080 low with temporal AA and 4GB textures. I can't say the same about consistency in Battlebit Remastered, as I saw much higher scores on the other Ryzen APUs. Still, at 1080 potato settings, the 8845HS managed over 100 FPS on average, with 1% lows of about 60. CS2 came in at almost exactly 144 FPS on average, and is a pretty great experience for either casual players or casuals who get a bit too full of themselves and think they're hot shit because they won a few deathmatches. Uh, I'm talking about a friend of mine, of course. I normally test Fortnite in DX12 on these APUs, and you can probably expect somewhere north of 100 FPS at low settings. This time I thought I'd give Performance Mode a try in order to compare to the older Intel-based machines. In this case, the 8845 can manage about 170 FPS on average, though it wasn't until my third game that it eventually settled down and stopped stuttering all over the place. This places it 40 frames higher than the Ultra 5125H and almost double what I'd usually expect from a 12th or 13th gen Intel i9. Finally, this was about the best Overwatch 2 experience I've had on a mini PC so far. The 134 FPS average at 1080 low beats the next best result by about 15 frames, that being the Ryzen 9 7940HS. Dare I say it? You might even be able to turn up settings a bit. I have two conclusions to reach then. Firstly, the GM KTech K8. Most of my comments about the mini PC itself are echoes of what I said in the K9 review last week. It's more of a budget offering among devices in this class, and some aspects of the construction and port selection reflect that, but on the whole, it's not that bad of a compromise. If you're interested in buying the K8, there's a link below, and at the time of posting this video on May 13th, 2024, I'm told there's a 7-day sale event on Amazon. The final conclusion, however, is for the Ryzen 7 8845HS. Needless to say, as of right now, owners of K6s or other 7840HS powered systems don't need to rush to trade in their old model, as a 60% performance improvement to the neural processor isn't worth that much money. For now, the NPU has extremely few applications in productivity and zero in gaming. That doesn't mean this will always be the case. AI productivity software is the Wild West right now, and who knows what new advances tomorrow will bring that would really benefit from extra NPU performance. As for gaming, AMD is rumoured to be working on a new version of FSR that will use machine learning hardware, and if that turns into reality, then there may be some tangible reason to own an 8000 series APU over a 7000 series. On the other hand, maybe that's all just smoke, and you're paying for a gimmick that will never give a return on your investments. Such is life at the bleeding edge. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.